All right, so um, today we've got a very exciting uh, panel. We've got uh, represent, representatives from the sort of the mobility side of the world, the entrepreneurs out there doing exciting things. We've got representatives from the insurance innovation side of things, and we have our own Ed Axon, our, our uh, global head of BD, who's going to uh, represent Trove in the conversation. So uh, please welcome Colin Barry, founder of, of Bright Mobility. Maybe Colin will go to you for a little bit of inter um, introduction about yourself and uh, Bright the company. Yeah, sure. Thanks a million. And yeah, so we're uh, Bright Mobility Limited, uh, headquartered in Galway. Um, we're an ex-automotive industry uh, business. We were motor dealers for many years, partners with uh, a lot of the big manufacturers, Ford, BMW, uh, Mitsubishi, Toyota. Um, we had we had manufacturer contracts with about fourteen different manufacturers at one stage between after sales and 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 and, um, uh, and sales. We partnered company with all of them over the last five years. We ended up um, selling the company end of twenty eighteen. Um, exited the uh, automotive business um, on the back of just some you know overall feelings that started coming over over a number of years that a lot of people were talking about you know, that we will probably talk about today. Um, and uh, we, we, we came up with the idea of going after the, the smaller vehicle, smaller device, connected social um, devices that, um, that would have a tech back end. Um, and I myself have, a, have somewhat of a tech background, worked, for, worked in mobile. Um, and in, in, in infrastructure for a while. Um, so yeah, we started right about 18 months ago. We've been making slow progress, but good progress. Um, um, and we work in the e-bike, e-scooter, e-tricycle, connected shared devices for um, corporate uh, cities, campuses, etc. cetera. So um, uh, yeah. It's an asset rental business, um, as basic asset rental ideas, but you know, with a with a nice uh, technical back end to it. Great. Well, thanks, Colin. Uh, let's move across to Adrian Copeland, who's Chief Operating Officer at Accelerate, uh, which is part of AXA XL. Adrian. Hi there. Um, yeah, my name is Adrian Copeland. I work for the AXA group, um, specifically um, um, the Excel part of that, so AXA Excel. So the Excel part of it is a specialty um, unit within inside AXA, um, bought by, Excel Catlin was bought by AXA a couple of years ago. Um, within Accelerate, which is the part of the area um, I am responsible for, we are looking um, at innovative models around insurance. So uh, from new distribution to new risk to um, anything, new technology, um, anything that fits probably a little bit out of the ordinary from what we write today. So uh, mobility and new mobility um, is something I've been um, I've been working on since my time in um, some time in Accelerate. So um, have a background in trying to understand um, how we support businesses like Bright um, get insurance. Great. Welcome, Adrian. And then uh, let's hand off to uh, to Ed Axon from Trove. Ed. Thanks, Ian. Uh, great to be here, and thanks again for uh, Colin and Adrian joining us. So uh, I'm Ed, global uh, Ed of BD for for Trove. Uh, Trove's extensively a insure tech business that I suppose uniquely and uh, excitingly sits at the front end of insurance, uh, and in, especially in the mobility space, where I get the enviable position of talking to both people like uh, Colin and the entrepreneurs of this world and also uh, trying to work out solutions with people like Adrian on the insurance. Yeah. So trying to bring the, I suppose, being the oil that allows these two ends of our spectrum to talk to each other. Uh, we're uh, excited to be involved in both ends of it. We, we talk a lot to emerging mobility and try to bring some technology and use of data to, to allow new models uh, and make them more attractive for the underwriters and people like the Adrians of this world. So really great to have the guys here and I look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Ed. Um, maybe to sort of um, to riff on your, your comments there uh, a little bit. So, so Trove does get sort of the opportunity to sit in the middle, which is, which is great. I think what's consistent across, you know, Colin's company, Adrian's company and our own is we're all sort of harnessing 
new behaviors. Um, and we're all sort of looking at consumers and the way where they're, they're consuming their, their transportation. And um, so there's a, there's a sort of an underlying change that is happening and that's rippling through these different industries. And so um, I think it's sort of informative, maybe Colin, if, if you would speak a little bit about, I mean, it's fascinating from your perspective that you've walked away, you know, from a, a, a lucrative industry, obviously great relationships with OEMs and you've seen sort of the tide changing, so to speak, but it'd be really great for you to tell us a little bit more specifically about the bright story. Like what is the sort of consumer um, behaviors that are changing? And maybe we can lead, lead then into that's all well and good. There's new demand arising, but what are the challenges for the business? But it'd be great to get a sense of what really gave you the nudge to say this is happening. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting story because it affects so many million of people, you know, globally in terms of the automotive business and Adrian would know this well, you know, in the UK. I mean, we're talking about two and a half million cars a year being sold in the UK. I mean, Ireland's a little tiny dot in that, but I mean, we usually put ourselves in that UK Irish um, sphere in terms of what happens, you know, we all, you know, mimic what's going on there in Ireland, you know, but I mean, Massive amounts of vehicles being sold, um, factories running in Europe, Japan, etc., pushing pushing hardware. Uh, it was it was a really extreme version of 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 um, uh, um, shareholder maximization from the from the manufacturer's point of view, pushing uh, volume at retailers. Um, extremely unsustainable. Um, 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 creating little pockets of, of, of demand, but not anywhere near the amount of vehicles that were being produced. So huge risk associated on that business for the retailers that, that basically, you know, if you're overstocked, you're, you're in serious trouble. And, um, and it is a massive high level stocking. So over, over the period of, of, of some years, um, we, we saw, yeah, it started maybe 10, it started in 2007 when um, the, 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 when the, the Celtic Tiger essentially was there, when there's huge numbers of cars being sold, um, um, mostly on finance, mostly on PCP type of products. Um, um, and, and it just wasn't really sustainable. Then we, we had the crash, then we came back. Um, but really, there was never anything else going to happen. But you know, more stock going to be forced down, down, down. There's too many competing factors. The manufacturer was competing for profit. Uh, the only way, in terms of a strategic mm -hmm. point of view, that you can make more money is if you charge more for your product. So they couldn't really put the price up because the price is very, very strong, very elastic. Um, or, or, or you cut your cost. This is a nice, handy one for them reducing profitability for dealers. So, um, you know, so let's take this little bonus here, let's take that little bonus here, and suddenly, oh, we're back making money again. Totally not sustainable. Car business is not making money. That's a globally known fact. And it, there, was, there wasn't really very many ways that that was gonna go only worse. So I have a background in software. Uh, I spent good seven years in the software business. Uh, I have a fair grasp of it. I developed my own, I had other startups, um, um, failed, learned, expensive failures, but we're, we're back. I mean, a really big thing for me is connection, is, is connected devices, networked connected devices that can provide data. And I've always been a big data person. Um, so, you know, with uh, networking, uh, with GPS data all improving, you know, you can just see this coming and coming and coming. You know, they talk about the autonomous drive, you know, Ireland in itself. And I, I, I was influenced as well by um, Fergus Moyles from, you know, companies like um, uh, uh, Fergus is, um, is based in Valio and Tum. Um, I mean, a really interesting guy. We were very lucky to be based in Galway to have, a, have a, had access to these type of, type of guys. Um, my MBA class introduced me to lots of people from Google and Facebook, you know. So, I mean, I started seeing that Ireland had like huge amount of influencers globally living, breathing, working and strategizing, you know, for, 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 for um, things that are happening globally. You know, Intel's, Intel's base in Kildare 
uh, you know, there's all of these companies that are creating value and innovation in Ireland that is really having huge effects. And I suppose I was lucky in that ma matter to, to have had access to these type of people. Um, I took a break to 2010 to do the MBA. It was the best thing I ever did. Like, you know, you can imagine how, how deflated and, you know, depressed and, and sad and stressed we were after the 2009 meltdown. So I kind of took a, took, a, I took a step out to do the MBA in UCD in 2010. Amazing experience. Very few salespeople there. So I suppose I regard myself as a salesperson. And I kind of, for, for the majority of my life, never thought there was value in that until I met like a lot of engineers in the MBA. And they're like, we would love to have what you have. And then I suppose I got a, a, you know, a newfound appreciation for the knowledge that I had and kind of pushed that on into the software business. Ended up being a Microsoft partner selling Azure products um, um, for IT Alliance Group in Dublin and then work for a mobile development agency, do mobile, you know, big contracts with corporates, developing innovative products on mobile. So I started my own startup um, called ragsbox.com. We were a platform for buying and selling um, um, pre-loved fashion. Well, that required a huge amount more money, so we didn't have the money. So we, I, I always liked, the idea of a platform business. Um, I like the idea of connectivity. I have a pretty strong marketing background. I used to work in the music business. I've done loads and loads and loads of things um, that kind of relate to, um, I suppose, a B2C market while also I've had a good uh, you know, business to business corporate background. So, so yeah, we like the idea. We work with an amazing company in, in, in Dublin called Post Design. We, we work together collaboratively for about four months coming up with a bright Love the bright concept in terms of that was the one of the first things we did after just the, the idea of the business we came up with the, with what the brand meant you know and then we came up with the the name bright and we rolled on from there so we partnered with uh, with the technology partner on, on the tech side we partnered with Segway for the last year and a half and um, um, so yeah we're 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 going really well we're going really well with Segway. Um, uh, we have another bike partner. We have two e-bike partners in China that we're working with, and uh, we're working with Bior bikes from 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 Switzerland as well. So, um, so just, uh, it talks a little bit about you sort of laid out the the stable of different types of vehicles there, and and talk to mm -hmm. us just a little bit about what is the demand that that you're satisfying? Like, what is presumably so, so, people are using vehicles in different ways. Sure, sure, sure. So we kind of divide it into like personal transport and corporate transport. Um, um, so personal transportation um, for people to get to work, to, to, to get around. Um, so that's basically uh, an e-bike that, you know, someone might lease off us for a month. Um, you know, it's connected, it's, it's, it's networked. Um, we can see data on it. People are traveling to work, traveling home. That's pretty much it. So they're replacing a car. You know, one of the things that we're, one of the, our taglines is like sell the car. So basically, if you have a second car, um, you can do it one car. Here's a really, really good option for you to, uh, to get to work uh, in, in quite a cost effective way, but also quicker. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the points, it's probably a cultural point that we have, you know, is, is about traffic. And our, you know, well, the love of the car, as you know, as you know, in the UK, the love of the car. Uh, but the second point, the major problem is traffic, right? So, I mean, traffic in Galway, you know, we love our tourists. Everybody's welcome to come to Galway, you know, I'm big Galway. I should be paid by the, the by, uh, by Port Fulcher, but, um, you know, uh, our traffic problem is, is horrific. You know, there's people spending way, way, way too much time in their cars when they should have better solutions. And that has as a result of um, loads of different factors. I don't want to start kicking the government or anything, you know, but there's there's obviously they'll they'll recognize there's been planning or there's been you know planning issues where, where whereby they didn't expect certain things. Urbanization is really important. You know, there's lots of the IDA, for example, in Ireland are bringing all of these amazing technology companies to to go with some of them are here in Port Shed today. Uh, and there's more coming, and there's more coming. So <clears throat> people are moving out of the country, and moving into the cities. The cities are where it's at, and we don't have the infrastructure, whether it be the roads or the public transport infrastructure, to enable those people to move around. It's a major problem. 
So we're solving the problem for people getting to work. Um, we have a second option then in terms of delivery. Um, we're, we're providing de delivery solutions, whether that might be a, we, we, have, we have delivery drivers for food coming to us who, who want to rent bikes, want to rent scooters, want to do anything to get around quicker. Um, you know, with delivery, for example, they get paid, uh, they, they get more, uh, they, get, they get access to more uh, delivery options when, um, when they go on to an electric mobility device, such as an e-bike, they get more orders. Um, and also, so we're, 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 um, we're working with corporates then on uh, moving staff around during the days, whether that be um, university campuses or office campuses to move people around. Traffic in cars, leaving cars at home uh, and keep, keeping people on devices, tracked, connected, um, so that's what we're offering, you know, so um, it's kind of a broad spectrum. We're, we're about to move into a very busy phase at the moment. Um, and 2021 for us is going to be our big year. This was meant to be our big year. But yeah. then Mr. COVID and the awful, you know, situation that arose, arose and we are where we are. So, um, but, you know, we're in the middle of a planning phase now. We're executing. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be working more with Trove in the coming year in the coming year and we've lots of really cool uh, uh, products packaged with our devices for companies that are you know have a really big interest in moving their people around you know yeah so you know you've given us a little bit of the history of of how you got here and and sort of in in the narrative you've given us you're now at the point of you've you've seen the demand you've understood it you've seen the macro trends you know you've built the concept of the business and as you said you're sort of now in execution mode um, I don't know if it was a surprise to you, but, but walk, walk us through the, the, the realization that, you know, I'm sure you realize at some point in here, I need to manage risk. I need insurance. Did sure. you know, walk us through the challenge it, it is and it has been to solve for insurance for yeah. this business? Yeah. I mean, we're, um, uh, I can't like Adrian is, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Adrian has to say. You know, Adrian's been through this for, for a little while now. I mean, um, we're, we're very stuck, you know, because we're in a new mobility area. Like uh, my vision for the business was to solve go with traffic problems and we can still do that. And we are going to do that, but there's, uh, you know, and, and, and we're not going, believe me, we're not going down the road talking about regulation today and, and everything. So, but uh, the difficulty we have is basically people don't really understand. It. People don't really understand what we're trying to do. Uh, are, are we doing like, you know, uh, like, are you renting out? What, I, we don't know what you're doing, you know, because we've never seen it before. So um, uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, show a little bit of data, show people look where we've got a really strong pedigree in terms of maintenance and servicing and, 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 and that kind of thing. Look at this cool data we can produce. Look at these amazing manufacturers we're working with on the product, the safety. Um, you know, so we're working through all those things, but like, yeah, it's been a real struggle. We, you know, I mean, uh, we, we have an amount of insurance, but we need way more, way better insurance. So, um, um, so we want to be able to offer our customers peace of mind, which they have a little bit of now, but it needs to be just strengthened up in terms of uh, if you rent one of our vehicles, like what status is that? Is it at, you know? Um, so we're very close oh, to getting there. Oh. Colin, I have a question, because I, I spent quite a lot of time with you, and equally I spent quite a lot of time with Adrian, on, on, so I, I have, I suppose, a luxurious position to see both ends of the spectrum, and I would, I would question whether your statement about uh, people don't understand what you're doing, because you're not alone in that, I mean, I, I think there's a, a wise somebody like yourself and bright is very innovative there's 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 others like yourselves whether it be in france or in the u.s or uk or do you think there's a fine line you tread between people not understanding what you're doing and you and us potentially as trove because we're we're trying to solve for you not spending enough time understanding the insurance world and how it has to operate. Um, yeah, for sure. 
absolutely. Very, very interesting point. I mean, uh, I'm kind of a nerd for these things. So I do like eat this stuff up. I have a fair idea. I'm not going to say I'm anyway an insurance expert, but I, I think I have a fair understanding now. A year ago, maybe not so much, um, but I, I have a fair understanding now of how the system works. You know, I'm sure Adrian will, will be able to add lots of, 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 you know, points to this that we don't really see. But look, the fact of the matter is with the insurance business, it's a profit driven business. You know, we're not, you know, a, you know, we're not like standing out there with, you know, with gold coins dripping from our, 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 our scooters. The guys are looking at us kind of going our, our bikes or whatever we're doing. There are guys looking at us going, you know, I can just go and insure this hotel over here and make loads of money and spend my time doing that. Like, why do I need to look at this business? Like for, for us though, like um, what we're saying is like, you know, come with us. You know, we have a very good understanding of predictable risk. We want to show that basically we can reduce risk in, in many different ways you know, as far as possible. And, and, and sh we will show you that the learnings we can make along the road, you know, we can pivot really quickly because we're small, we're innovative, and we, we're smart, right? So, so we do, while, while the insurance business is, 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 is difficult, I do understand the, 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 the complexity of it, and I do understand how, how it, it's not straightforward. It's not it's not very easy for us to get across the line. So, look, I'm I'm fully aware of that, and I know. Well, I, I would I would I would I was going to sorry, and I was going to I'm going to throw this back at Adrian in a moment. I the reason I ask it is because I think Trove as a business has learned a lot in the last eighteen months and two years. Maybe I mean we've been around eight years, and I think it's Ian would probably agree with it. It's probably taken us the last two years really when we've started to focus heavily on you know, a large part of our thinking around mobility and emerging risk and emerging mobility to really try to understand uh, how insurance works, both mathematically, but also ethically and, and uh, the, the issues they have. I, I uh, and again, I will I'll throw this over to you in a moment, but the word, uh, you know, if, if you think of entrepreneur, even things like true, we're, we're often called a disruptor to the, an industry and you know, that we try to be really positive in that we work with the insurance companies as well as the entrepreneurs. I am yet to meet uh, an insurance company that doesn't want to innovate. I haven't, I mean, I'm with Tro three and a half years, and hopefully Ian would agree. We don't, we don't often go into these big brands who, uh, who say, no, we're not interested. We just want to continue to do it the way we are. It doesn't happen. You know, every single one of them, I have met, I said, yeah, yeah, we absolutely want to be, we see digitalization, the race for digitalization of the insurance world is a huge part of what we're doing. Uh, we see emerging mobility is a huge part of what we want to do. How, but, but, but it takes longer, the expectation, the frustration I have is probably some of yours. That's why, you know, I think we've learned a lot and I'd love to understand from Adrian, you know, he sees, he's, he's quite an entrepreneurial guy himself, he sees the frustration people like yourself have, you know, why, Adrian, why, why does it happen? Is, is it understanding or is it just the industry? Is it? Um, good question. I mean, I think, um, I think you're right. I think we want to, every one of the, every insurance company has invested in innovation, has invested in um, mobility, um, uh, looking at mobility, and, you know, you look at cyber as a new risk, right? You couldn't buy a cyber policy X years ago, and now everybody's um, writing cyber as a as a as a risk. It's a, it's a, one of the largest growing um, lines of business. So there is an understanding and a um, and a, a willingness to take new risk. Um, I do think there's a there's a couple of things going on. First of all, mobility is connected with car insurance and car insurance, certainly in North America, I won't talk too much, I won't talk about the UK, but sort of transport insurance hasn't performed well over the last X amount of years. So there's a, there's a, an immediate, how, what, how, 
how do we protect ourselves by taking this um, mobility um, question on? So, so what are we, what are we, what are we trying to do by taking this new, new mobility risk on? And second of all, probably most importantly, why it moves so slowly is the price of a, of a, of a, let's just say a car insurance price, right? That's been built up over huge amounts of data for the last X amount of years. So, you know, there are companies today that can tell you the risk of driving on a particular road at a particular time of day in the US and in the UK. And, and that is based on huge amounts of data that has been built up. When you come to an insurance company or somebody comes to an insurance company and says, I'll tell you what, we've got all this data on how our, um, on how our mo new mobility solution is being used. That's great. But we can't go, how far can we go back to really see the trends of risk related to that particular mobility solution? So it immediately puts us at a, on, on a position that says, well, how are we going to price this? Now, you could argue, and, and, and many, and Axel have done a brilliant job at this in the autonomy space and others, that we have to do the best we can to price it. Um, but doing the best you can to price something isn't always what the innovation company want to hear because they think the price should be X and we want, and we think the price should be Y and that becomes a tough conversation. So I think in summary, it takes a long while because the models that we use to price today are very mature, very um, well understood. Um, and anything that involves a complete rip up of that process and using new data just takes longer than we would want it to take. And you know, you have innov innovation pe innovative people like me or innovation people like me in the organization who are desperate to move the organization forward to do certain things, but rightly so. You've also got um, you know, the, the underwriting and the, uh, and the actuarial and the data scientists actually trying to slow us down a bit to say, now, come on, what do we really understand about this risk? And I think when I, I think it is the only way we're going to get over this is partnership, but uh, that partnership does take time, and that partnership does does need need um, input from both sides over over a period of time. Adrian, so the way you describe this reminds me of of the innovator's dilemma, right? This notion of you have a business that's doing really well and everything is fine, and then you have this disruption over here. And you can't really marshal your resources towards the new opportunity because you feel like you'll disrupt the old opportunity, right? So you're living and breathing that, right, in, in, in terms of being within innovation within the insurance industry. So for, for, for the Collins of the world and for the Troves of the world, if the insurance company doesn't work out how to innovate, we don't enable these other industries. And so you're, you're kind of fighting that battle. So what does that look like? What are the tools? What are the... What are the um, the points of, of the argument that, that you can bring to bear to encourage the insurance company to actually innovate? Notwithstanding this, this, this uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the desire to make money. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we've got that Colin doesn't is shareholders. Um, so that's not, uh, you know, and we have to return, um, return to those shareholders. So that, that is a you know, you know, th there is a, sh you know, a view of capital that we must take into account here. But, but, but I don't think, you know, many insurance companies go into innovation for profit, right? So, so you know, the stuff that we do in the Accelerate is not, um, is not solely deemed successful on profit. I think the dilemma is less that we're, we're certainly not worried about um, the cannibalization of one industry over another, because it's going to be cannibalized. We know, it's, you know, we look at the autonomous car insurance product we launched, you know, it's, it, you know, we know that autonomous cars at some point are going to cannibalize the car insurance market, but we just, you know, so we have to understand it. I think, how do you, how do you make insurance companies be more innovative or um, support in this uh, is a very deep rooted and complicated answer um, in a sense of, in a sense of culturally, we've got to really embed that within our organizations and we've got to find a priority to do that the, the in a in an economic market right now where you know people are beginning you know with what's going on people are battening up the hatches and saying well how can we protect what we've got and and i think that's why i do agree with you i mean there's a lot of that's 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 just right better risk of what we've got to do today i i think one more thing i, I would add is 
we are working at ways, and I actually had a really good conversation with, our, uh, with a very senior underwriter um, yesterday about how we protect the downside, right? So, so that, you know, can we use the reinsurance market to really help us with some of these new risks, protect what could be a worst case scenario? Because if you take a, a mobility risk or, a, you know, and I'll talk about the US rather than Ireland because I just know more about that type of, you know, you could take a very small premium for something and somebody hits somebody and somebody does serious damage to that, to another individual. And you are talking, you know, so, social inflation now means you are talking about a huge loss, multi-million dollar loss for a premium that may or well have been in the single dollars. So we've got to write an awful lot of risk to balance that out. Um, and we've got to find ways working with um, the um, innovation companies and with our partners and with our reinsurance companies to balance that as a, um, as a challenge. But that's what we do. That's what we should do. We should take risks from our customers. We should take risks right in order to the economy work. It just might not move as quickly as um, people like Colin would want it to work. Go ahead, Ed. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so to pick up on that, Adrian, so if I'm sitting in a big organization like, like your own, like Axe or, uh, you know, any of them, Allianz or Aviva or Swiss Re, and many, many of them we have many friends in, do, do, is, it, is there a mass sort of agreement that what the likes of Colin and others are doing, uh, there is, that is the future? Is there a, a so you, you very early on there linked sort of car insurance with, with mobility, I suppose, because it's used my data. Is there an acceptance? Because I, I've never really, I've never worked in one of these. Is there acceptance that actually the future does look very different? You know, yes. It, yeah. So there's a huge upset. So insuring new, like, is what the insurance company's got, insurance has got to be good at, pandemic. Another perfect example where the insurance industry is now looking at how you could possibly cover that cyber another good example new mobility good example autonomy new and you know good we know that these risks need covering for our customers we're there to take risk for our customers and um very rarely do you get anybody within insurance organizations who are really questioning um social trends what you get is is how do we, how do we ensure that? What is what is it we need to do um, to to ensure that? And and as I said, it, it, I, I think it's more of a timing issue than a than a than, than too much. And and it create it it requires insurance companies, and there are some better than others. I think Axel is um, is certainly better than um, others in, in in many ways. You know, is an innovative thing. It takes takes us a to take a bit of a risk. I know that take, I know that sounds a bit daft as we are a risk taking organization, but we need to find a way to actually take a risk on some of these new, because until we get that data, until we get that understanding of the risk, it's going to be very, very difficult. So we've got to find ways to, to take that risk um, in a way that we are comfortable with the, um, with the, the potential um, outcome that we're taking. Adrian, to, to begin to tie a couple of threads together a little bit, we have um, Trova, Trova and Axa, Excel have worked together on some of the AV programs that you, you referenced. And part of that conversation has been data. Um, talk to us a little bit about, about how, you know, it's always a headline in these conversations, data, data, data. But can you kind of parse that a little first? Like, what is it that the insurance company is looking for? Why is that data important? Colin said he's got this, you know, he's got data ready and available to share. Like, what, what do we need to do with that data for the insurance company? Or what data is that? Shine a light on it first a little bit there. Well, I think in, I think in mobility terms, well, I, I mean, data's the key, right? So can you map the world from a specialty perspective? Okay. How do you... How do you tell the answer to a customer um, before they ask you the question because you've got their data? I mean, if you look what Google, Facebook, you know, Instagram, all these companies are doing, they're, they're using data in order to give you the answer before you ask the question. And, and, and I look at insurance as, as an apex industry that, that needs to be able to, you know, needs to be able to do better at what we do um, at that type of answering that type of question because we have huge amounts of data just often it's unstructured um, and we don't know how to access it you know the amount of data that we've got sitting in pdf static files and so forth is just immense so what i would um i mean 
getting the data for someone like you know from a from a company that you know the Collins company or from some tribe is it's probably not it's not the issue yeah the issue it's like understanding it what does it mean how do we change it I mean the big thing with um, insurance is can we change behavior using that data right so so what is it you can do to to start to change customer behavior using that data um, to make them safer make them a better risk make society better by being uh, by being safer so I'm not sure I've answered your question um, particularly well because you know data is such a broad topic as you said and 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 depending on the risk you're insuring depends on what they require but I I guess the answer is how do we make the data meaningful and how do we um, and how do we make that that data help us improve a risk or understand that risk that we know that we're getting the right amount of income for the risk that we're taking on yeah I think to riff on it a little bit one of the one of the complaints we hear from um, from our customers, so um, a fairly generalized complaint is, as you said, you know, the price isn't right. And, um, you know, to take Colin as an example, very smart businessman, right? He, if you give him the information, he'll make decisions that make sense for his business. And so, um, as you said, Adrian, the ability to be able to feed information back to change behavior is really important. So. I th this is sort of a little bit of my soapbox, but I think the real opportunity here to get both sides of the coin working together are to get data back to Colin, which gives him an understanding of, of his true risk cost. So it, as an example, you know, let, let, let sort of, this is totally made up, but just to illustrate the point, older people renting bicycles maybe are more risky than younger people renting bicycles. Who knows if that's true or not? But if that comes out in the data, and the insurer, Adrian's insurer, is feeding back to him um, a different price based on each of those riders, for example. He can make decisions. He can decide, well, actually, you know what? A huge amount of my clients are actually are, um, you know, older than 35. And yes, they are in the slightly riskier um, uh, category. However, they rent the more expensive bikes, so the margin is higher. So that's okay. That's a risk. That's a cost I'm willing to take on on board, and so I think that is. It's a very simple example, but I think that is the is the key. So maybe I'd love to hear from Colin on this as well. But let, let me, yeah, let, before I, let me just respond to that because I think uh, you're right, right? So, so um, and, and Colin, sorry, uh, I, I want to be very quick. Uh, trans, when you go and speak to our customers, and we, we've done this very very recently in um, in the US and Canada, transparency is the is what people are driving for, right? So, so we get told over and over again, people only buy by cost. But actually, a, a, a key hypothesis of ours is that we, if you by providing transparency, you change behavior. By by telling somebody why their cost is their cost, um, is you is you change behavior. Um, that is a a hypothesis that needs to be right for this market to work. That people actually don't just buy pay by cost, uh, buy by price. Um, they really do mean it when they say they want transparency. Now, I'm not sure there's too many markets where we've actually tested that out, right? So if I say to you, your premium is $100, and here's the transparency about why your premium is $100, but somebody comes along and offers you a premium for $80 because they want to enter the market cheaply or they want to just take on more risk, and you just leave us to go and take that risk at $80 um, after all the work that we've done to help you understand your risk, that's where the insurance companies um, um, are struggling somewhat because people, we've got to close that gap between yes, give me transparency, but actually, when we when we like when we see the transparency, we don't like the answer, we just move the risk, um, and that that becomes a challenge for us. And that is one of the things from an innovation perspective I'm really trying to deal with um, in the US fleet. But sorry, Colin, I'll hand that over to. Yeah, I mean, transparency is 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 important. I think from what we've tried to do all along is um, we've tried to communicate a culture of safety. Um, we've tried to communicate uh, how we, we would like to you to use our product. Um, fairness is important. So from our perspective, we're saying, okay, we can provide a service. We need to get to a price that's, you know, uh, 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 acceptable. So are, were you yesterday taking the bus? Are you tomorrow taking the taxi? You know, how does our price reflect that? So 
how far do you think you're going to go in terms of distance on, on one of our devices? Um, uh, and then we, we have to think about all of our costs, etc. Insurance has to slot in there. So I think it's really interesting where, where you say that, you know, when people come back and say, oh, well, this is what we think the price should be because we've done our cost analysis. But like I, I've, I've spent, I've been many, many years in business and I know that that it doesn't feel right. Like if, if, if your partner isn't making money um, or isn't providing a service or isn't happy providing a service, they just don't really want to be there. What we're looking for is a partner in an insurance business that basically will uh, be happy to insure. Uh, we can slot that insurance into our product, uh, put margin on it and make money. If the insurer said, if we go back and say, oh, well, we want it to be X, and the insurer is like, no, well, that's not what we're talking about. Well, then to me, the, the product isn't insurable. And and because, uh, like, you know, it just takes so much time, as, as Ed knows, you know, and, and you know, Adrian, like, these things take so much time to go through. Um, so, I mean, transparency, definitely, like, we are trying to provide that. And we're trying to say, right, break it right back down into, um, you know, a predictable risk where we know who the corporates are, who the people are, who our writers are, you know, you're a member of a club and you have responsibility as a member of the club to be, you know, responsible to our code of ethics or our safety plan or however, you know. And, and you know, over the last number of years, we've definitely seen from a, from a, a, a cultural point of view that people don't go out nicking bikes and stealing bikes, you know, in general. They don't try and, you know, um, pull the wool over eyes or they don't try and, you know, do silly stuff because they don't have time. They're, they're busy trying to get to work or get home to their kids. So, like, it's become more predictable. And I, I like this kind of angle that you've kind of gone down because that's what it is all about. That data piece is all about that we can show you that John drives from here to here every day, every day, every day because he has a bloody mortgage and he has to pay the mortgage by going to this point from this point and this point is home where his two kids are and then he comes home and then he starts a second job as a dad and then he goes back here back here back here and basically it's taken him hours and hours and hours because he's stuck in traffic to go from Salt Hill to Park Moor and like it's crazy he should be spending more time with his kids uh, his transport should be costing him a fraction of what he's paying for his BMW. Colin, so, Colin, can I just can I can I cover course because I think that's a very relevant point, and I'm conscious of time here, but and I'm going to be very controversial here. Surely, surely if that if just what you've said there, surely it's incumbent upon the entrepreneur to put the right price to the consumer. So you just said earlier there, well, we have, we have looked at, you know, what does a bus cost and what does a taxi cost and what does this, that, and the other cost and how much does my fuel cost? And therefore, you have to be complementary or at least, you know, similar value. But surely the industry, I mean, I've never met a taxi operator that's making money. There's no bus companies making money. And it's a bit of like the old analogy of, of the buying a pound of milk at, at the supermarket where people actually think that's how much it costs. When the supermarkets are actually hammering the hell out of the suppliers to drive down the cost of a pint of milk to get people into buying milk, is, is there a danger that the people like yourselves and the Ubers of this world and the Limes and the, actually are in danger of pricing it wrong for the consumer and then the consumer will only value it at a certain value, which then makes the value chain in insurance, which includes the agents of this world and yourselves and your ability to clean them and service them, not feasible. Surely there's, surely there's your responsibility for, for that guy going from, from X to Y to Z with no traffic, as quick as he can, gets home to his kids better, that that has to be priced properly or else yeah, it has it'll to, never work. It has to, sure. And like, we're not saying that essentially, you know, we're not saying essentially that, you know, this has to be, cheap, cheap, cheap. I mean, I think people are aware that they have to pay for transport. Uh, so, you know, you know, someone can go uh, onto Alibaba and buy a scooter for 250 quid and use it for a year to go to work on. 
We're not going to stop anybody doing that. You can go down the road and buy a secondhand bicycle for 30 quid and go to work on it. You know that, you know, but so it's a transport piece. But what we're trying to provide is a predictable service with their maintenance, with their servicing, with, 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 with hardware that we stand over and people use it as a cost, right? Uh, a transport cost. So we definitely but therefore, think- But therefore, Colin, therefore, that's exactly, I get on a lime scooter in Paris and mm-hmm. stood it around, we're looking at the sites and whatever I was doing, and I thought to myself, that's far too cheap. That's far too yep. cheap. So the experience that I had had, that is far too cheap. Now, you then, roll that back into the value chain where you have to try and insure it, you have to try to service it, and you have to try to clean it and move it around. Yeah. Surely there is a responsibility of the industry, the emerging mobility industry, to price it right for the consumer. And right. set, set a price that, that, yeah. that, that you can make money, potentially, that Adrian's company, uh, Axis can make money, that actually it's priced, because I think there's a real danger uh, a real, real danger that if we drive price to a certain point, there's nobody. You got, as Adrian said, all you're going to do is shift around insurers continually until somebody wants to take a punt. Oh on no, it. for sure, yeah. Like I mean, there's loads of this. You know, uh, you know, as Adrian was was, was saying in terms of his um, his shareholder return. I mean, there's there are loads of issues, and uh, you know, around that. I mean, in terms of pricing it right, is it too cheap? You know, uh, you could give something away, um, but. I suppose what we're trying to do is we're trying to come to a, like <clears throat> you look at Bird or Lime in the States, you know, I mean, in terms of their pricing at the moment, the price is going up, you know, for sure. It's getting, you know, well, you guys know well what, what the price of the cost of living in California is. I mean, things are getting, getting, getting dear. Um, I suppose from our perspective, from, from, a, from a, a small micro mobility company that's trying to gain traction, we're trying to build our user base. We're trying to show, we're trying to entice people to come on. Um, we're trying to be safe. Um, we're trying to be transparent. But, you know, so people do see it as an alternative to car transport. They're expecting it to be cheap. But then again, you know, they are also, we're, we're telling them, look, we know how much you're on the road for. So it's quite difficult for us to price them right now at say one guy you know is 100 euros and another guy is a thousand euros because but, but equally equally colin that's a very good point because as adrian said earlier car insurance has got lots of data yeah i don't believe that it's and again i'm again <laughs> controversial i don't i think you're absolutely right you want to give people it's a classic marketing you know you want to give people an opportunity to get on one of your bikes and test it out and show actually that they can get home to my kids much quicker etc etc and look at how great it was and it's better for the environment and all these tick boxes but in many ways you can't expect the insurance company to pay for that you know until adrian has two years of data and you've proved actually that x y and z is better yeah surely that model has to be a way where the consumer can test which is what you need them to do because if you're really confident and i am haven't been on an e-scooter and an e-bike I think more and more people get on them, the better, because they will realize actually it is a viable option. But I don't think the industry, the insurance industry necessarily should be the ones picking up the can for it. So, but, but the point I suppose is, right, so say you are, um, John is living in Salt Hill and he's going to park more, it's 10 kilometers, it's taking him 45, 50 minutes in the evening in traffic um, and on an e-bike it takes him 25. So like, I think John, presented with the options of potentially buying trip insurance but like so like as an add-on now this is a whole other conversation about add-ons versus included in price but basically you know potentially therefore and we've talked about this internally here that basically you offer you uh, you offer the insurance uh, you know you offer the insurance as an add-on to show okay well look what this can offer you you know in terms of the total package you know, that's something that we could potentially look at. Um, but as a whole, we're not asking insurance companies to cover it. Like the insurance company will definitely tell us what they're covering, what they're not. We've been through this, you know, and, and we're very clear about what we can and can't do. Um, and, you know, we're not, you know, putting, uh, uh, you know, we're, 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 we don't disagree with that. Um, I think from, from, uh, uh, from 
you know, the bigger VC funded companies, Lyman and Bird and all these guys who have, you know, gazillions of dollars that can go into an insurance company and say, here's a check, you know, tell us how much it's going to cost. That's great. And then they kind of work on it in the next few months to see if they can get it down. That's fine. They have first mover advantage, etc. But for someone like me, I think what I'd like to see is a package from, you know, um, uh, an AXA XL or AXA or whoever, you know, to say, right, you know, this is your limitation. This is what you're allowed to do. These are the parameters you're allowed to work in. This is the audit trail that we want, you know, in terms of your reviews. Uh, you know, to me, the writing of the check at the start of the year could financially be really, you know, beneficial to me. But it, I don't think it's really what, where I want to be. Like, so it's basically, right, uh, we're going to bet that it's going to be 50 grand for the year. Give us 50 grand. So there's your 50 grand. Great. Off we go. Whereas basically, you know, that's just gambling as far as I'm concerned. Like, you know, you know, you're not taking any of the data about the future risk. You know, you're just kind of betting on something and saying, right, this is what we think it might be. So there you go. But I'd much prefer a collaborative effort where we show the data, where we can say, right, you tell us what you think it is it should be. You know, there's a conversation going around and you know about this conversation that basically maybe e-scooters should be priced the same as a car. Right. So if John is using his car to go from Salt Hill to, to, to park more up to, up to the factory every day, uh, and what, if, it, if his car is costing him, I don't know, uh, 500 quid for the year to insure, right? You know, so basically what the conversation that's going around right now is because e-scooters, et cetera, are new mobility and we don't really understand them, so we have to put them in a box. So let's put them in the car box. But I'm not saying that 500 quid wouldn't be the right price for an e-scooter because if he's getting to work, he's saving on his fuel, he hasn't spent 10 or 15 grand or 20 grand or 100 grand on a 7 Series. He's, 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 he's basically leasing a vehicle off us that will cost him, you know, two or 300 quid a month. You know, it's definitely worthwhile. So putting the price of insurance on a car, on an e-scooter, I think could be well workable, but the well, insurance companies need to tell us. But you're not taking into consideration, Colin, they'll have to go to North Face in the winter in Galway and buy a whole new set of wet, wet gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there's a new, yeah, don't worry, we're working on it. We're working I'm, a, I'm, we're very working conscious of, I'm very conscious of time here. Uh, Adrian, just closing for you, you know, if you're in Colin's shoes and you were sitting and you were at, at a consultancy business, and you were consulting with Colin to help him get insurance, what would be one of the key things you'd be telling him about you know, how to go about it? What would, what would be one thing you might tell him? Change industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, you need, to find a, you, you need to find a willing partner. I mean, everything Colin said, I agree with. You need, you need to find a partner that's willing to learn, that's willing to work with you on the solution. Um, but the solution is going to be a likely to be a check up the front up front today right so it, it might be two or three years before we can uh, before that that partnership gets what where as far as colin wants it to get to and clearly we've got all sorts of partnerships with all sorts of large organizations where we're doing exactly what colin wants us to do you know in in a sense of taking data on a per trip basis we've got our own telematics um, offering on the personal line space in europe we're now looking at one for fleet in the us you know, we've got, we, these partnerships exist. So, so my, um, um, I don't know whether it's a tip or not. It, it's kind of like you've got to find out where the, where the organ, where in the organization people are interested in this, who's specializing it. There are a bunch of, um, and how do you, how do you make it simple for the insurer to understand the risk? Um, and what is the, what is the offering? What's the risk? And how do you make it as simple as possible? I'm, I'm not sure that particularly helps or answers your question uh, because I, I, I feel for, for Colin and, and where he is in his, um, uh, in his kind of life cycle. But there are definitely organizations like AXA that want this type of risk. Um, but it isn't, but it takes a partnership approach and it takes time. Um, and, and that's what we've, you know, uh, and that's, you've just got to find the right organization using the right broker that can help broker that type of um, that type of relationship well hopefully that's the uh, the role we're playing Adrian. yeah you, you beautifully uh, segue that's in there you know hopefully we're going to find the right solution for 
So again, conscious of time, Ian, we should start probably thinking about uh, wrapping, wrapping this up. Uh, is there anything you want to add into it, Ian, in the conversation as we think about it? No, uh, well, listen, it's been a fascinating conversation. As you said, Ed, we've been, you and I have been in this industry a couple of years now, heading, headed towards four years, but we continue to learn. So I have learned um, quite a bit. So Adrian, Colin, I just want to say thank you. Uh, really enjoy working with, with uh, both of your organizations for, for multiple reasons. So thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank thanks you very much. much. Likewise, Cheers, guys. guys. Thank you very, very much. It's been, uh, it's been great. And uh, hopefully uh, we get an opportunity. We need to get Adrian one of those bright T-shirts. That might help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of It's in the post. It's in the post. <laughs> 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 See you later, guys. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.